January 1st, 2000 came and the world was still here. Nuclear bombs did not explode, satellites did not fall from the sky, a meteor did not hit, the rapture did not happen, and a lot of people were disappointed by this. As it turns out, they weren't living in a special time that made them special. There would be another year, and then another one. And the ages would roll on with or without them. 2000 has a very good ring to it. It's a very round and large number, which is why you would see it slapped onto the end of everything, not just video games, for almost a decade. There are songs about it even in the 70s, about how the then children will no longer be children but adults, building a better world. To be fair, that was kind of a communist song, but still. The number itself, going beyond 1000, going beyond 900, beyond the 90s. It spoke of that novelty, the change that people wanted to see in the world, and change they would get. After being shook to pieces by the US government, Bill Gates decided that maybe taking over the world wasn't really the right thing for him, so he stepped down from his role as Microsoft CEO, leaving none other than Steve Ballmer in charge, and turning more towards charitable causes like wiping out malaria. Just a month later, Microsoft would release Windows 2000, a fairly beloved operating system that changed the kernel from the 9x kernel to the NT kernel, and later that year they would also release Windows ME, still based on the 9x kernel. This was the least popular version of Windows until well, Vista and 8 would come along. This was also the year when the company that brought us 3D accelerators began to slowly vanish. 3D effects made a few unfortunate business decisions which led it to become unable to support itself, so instead it opted to be purchased by Nvidia. And over the course of the next two years, it would cease to function, it would stop making video cards, and would become just a memory, as well as a brand tied into the concept of the SLI, which works differently than it did in the NVIDIA implementation. Sadly, the same can be said about Looking Glass software, not that it became SLI, but that it became just a memory. Although that very same year the studio released Thief 2 The Metal Age, a superb game that refined the sneaking genre to a point that some would say has yet to be surpassed, the studio went belly up. Most Mostly it was the fault of the then publisher Idols Interactive that had a couple of problems, and yet would still try in various ways to continue the Thief series in later years. People that had left Looking Glass Studios before this happened, among them Warren Spector, went to work with one of the creators of Doom, John Romero himself, at a company called Ironstorm. At that time, the company had two branches. One of them, the main one, had spent years and many millions of dollars making a game called Daikatana, a game so aggressively marketed that it downright insulted the audience, a high train so utterly full of itself that it brought downright glee to many when it derailed the game featuring many bad design decisions, some of them regarding the save game option, terrible AI for your allies, meaning you could not finish some levels because of them, and contained numerous other blunders. It was one of the first major hype disasters. Although there have been games that didn't really live up to their promise since the beginning of video games, Daikatana stood out for being so badly managed and overhyped that the end result became a black stain upon the video games industry. For a decade to come, Daikatana would be a punchline to every possible joke, a punching bag, and in general, a game that no one really admitted to enjoying. And while it did become one of the main reasons for the death of Ironstorm, the studio created with the motto Design is King, the other branch of the company created a game that is the primary reason why the name Ironstorm would live forever. Ironstorm Austin created Deus Ex that year, a combination of RPG and first person shooter in the vein of System Shock 2 a bit and with a lot of influence from the immersive sims that Warren Spectre had worked on back at his looking last days. According to his own statement, Deus 6 was made out of the frustration of the limitations they had with Thief back then. And the end result is without a doubt one of 
the greatest games ever made. The lineage of its gameplay can be traced all the way back to the ancient Ultima days, letting the player decide how to proceed, how much violence to use and how much to exploit the games that tend to simulate the real world for fun, profit or simply because why not. But Deus Six doesn't stand out just because of its gameplay. Its world, the interaction with its characters and story it had continues to make it relevant even to this day. A story of terrorism, of conspiracy, manipulation and prophecy. We'll get to that next week. It's said that every time someone mentions Deus Six, somebody else will reinstall it. And when it came out, it couldn't really muster enough sales to balance out like a tunnel, leading to the closure of the Dallas branch of Iron Storm, leaving Eidos in charge of what was left. The company had already purchased 51% of the studio back in 1999. And from there, things went a bit downhill. One of the reasons why Deus Ex couldn't become a monster hit back then was that the market was filled with phenomenal games across the board. And the PlayStation 2 was also launched that very same year and would become the dominant platform for the next five years. Sure, new consoles would be released, but in terms of success, they were nothing but a fraction. Not that the launch lineup of the PlayStation 2 inspired that much confidence. I mean, it's not that Tiny Splitters, SXX, Summoner, Midnight Club or Dynasty Warriors 2 weren't bad games, but compared to what that platform would get in just one year, they were not very large in terms of sales. Some of the other consoles were still getting great games as well, like Rare's follow-up to GoldenEye 007 in the form of Perfect Dark, the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was also released for the N64 alongside Paper Mario, but when it came to Nintendo, the big hit of that year was the simple fact that the Game Boy had reached 100 million units sold. That is a number that only the PlayStation could rival, and this was a handheld. The Cigarette Dreamcast as well got a couple of classics back then in the form of Jet Set Radio and Fantasy Star Online, which was the first MMORPG created for consoles. The console the concept wasn't really possible in prior generations because none of them had an internet connection by default, and the original PlayStation itself would get some really cool games like Driver 2, where you would be driving cars one moment and then going around on foot and stealing somebody else's car. This idea will be expanded upon really soon by another developer. I know that I may be glossing over some really great console games in this show, and I'm sorry for that. It's not my intention to ignore them or tone down their importance importance, but with the limited time I have, I must carefully choose what to focus on. And in this case, the year 2000 was just filled with great multi-platform games and PC games. Blizzard released a follow-up to Diablo, in the form of Diablo 2. A game made after years of crunch mode where developers worked themselves nearly to death, resulting in a game that is still considered as being the best of the series. Although there were a lot of attempts at making hack and slash RPGs back then, a uh, few notable others being last year's Darkstone, or to a lesser degree this year's Nox, none of them could hold a candle to Diablo 2. It had hacking, it had slashing, it had a fantastic loot system, it had superb cinematics, great atmosphere, tough bosses to beat, many different classes with different builds to experiment with, and Battle.net. The ability to have fun with friends, strangers while you were trying to beat that really tough fight, or just chill out while crawling through the sewers of Ludgolain. Diablo 2 was an immense success for Blizzard and would be followed up by an expansion one year later, but it was also the last game actually released by Blizzard North, the studio that was once Condor would soon start losing people and fade away. It would try to make Diablo 3 quite a few times, but it never came to be. At the opposite spectrum of the RPG stood Bioware's Baldur's Gate 2, an RPG that meant to give you another taste of classic D&D gaming with a great story, great characters, and slightly improved gameplay over its predecessor. Meanwhile, Icewind Dale, made by Black Isle Studios, tried to go even deeper into the D&D rabbit hole by making every party character 
your own. Sure, that meant you would be losing the likes of Minsk and Boo, but you could make every character exactly how you wanted them to. And it maintained the same basic gameplay established by Baldur's Gate years before, and was reused in Planescape Torment and would continue to be a staple of the Infinity Engine era of D&D games, much like first-person exploration and top-down combat was a staple of the Gold Box era of D&D a decade earlier. Speaking of that, it is worth highlighting just how much things had changed within a decade. We went from this to this. That is a leap that we had not made in the decade before, or the one before that one, and have not made since. Maybe with the advent of ray tracing we'll get something similar, but until then, that period from 1990 to the year 2000 was a golden age for graphics and a painful one at the same time, what with so many competing standards and hardware manufacturers just vanishing into the night. Sure, graphics are still evolving slowly and some would say that's the only thing actually being worked on on video games these days, whereas everything else is a watered down rehash of what's currently popular with no new innovation or ideas, but there's not much of a leap. It's up to you to decide if that's right or not. What I can say for sure is that in the year 2000 there was room for the improvement of technology, graphics, story, characters, world, and gameplay, all of them resulting in some strange things. We had the, the likes of the action strategy game Sacrifice, created by some of the same people that brought us MDK, or Giant Citizen Kabuto, created by more of the people that brought us MDK, a game that stands out for being utterly ridiculous just like MDK and glorious at the same time, again just like MDK. One that did not take itself serious, having a lot of humor everywhere and the gigantic levels to explore. So again, just like MDK, only this one was set on an alien planet and had an asymmetrical multiplayer mode and a campaign as well where every creature you controlled was vastly different in terms of abilities, characteristics, size, and all of them vied for control of the islands. And since I mentioned an alien planet with giant levels, I apologize for omitting Outcast from last week's show. There were so many other great games released that year, a few of them being among my old-time favorites like Red Alert 2, Hitman Codename 47, American McGee's Alice, No One Lives Forever, and Need for Speed 5. Fun fact, Need for Speed 5 was at one time meant to be followed up by a racing game named Split Second. No, not the one that actually got released by a different company. I don't precisely remember the details, but that is what one of the developers of Need for Speed 5 said in an interview for the classic Cybernet show that people in the UK will remember and some of the people in Eastern Europe as well. That was a very enjoyable show as long as it was hosted by Lucy Longhurst. Now sure, Cybernet was mainly a really shallow succession of trailers but for its time, it was awesome. And Sea Dogs was also awesome, a pirating RPG made by Akela that let you manage a crew and conquer the seas with excellent tactical combat and a high enough degree of realism, as long as you didn't mind harmlessly bouncing off rocks, that the game felt believable. There was the same kind of believability that you would see in Soldier of Fortune, from the reactions of the enemies to being shot. They put a lot of effort into that. So much effort that you could shoot someone's gun out of their hand and watch them cower in fear. And this wasn't Deus Ex I'm talking about, this was Soldier of Fortune, the one where you got to shoot people in the balls and see them react to it. I should probably also mention that a certain studio called Paradox Development Studio really got started this year with the release of Europa Universalis, the first of what would soon be called the grand strategy genre. Sort of like 4X, but not really. And then there was Siege of Avalon that combined the age-old shareware model of distribution with the first part of it being free, and then it added the internet. You wouldn't order the game through the mail, you'd buy it and download it off the web. Although it was a nice enough RPG, internet distribution, payment systems, or the general infrastructure itself weren't really at the level where such a model could succeed yet. I mean, if it was all free, then yeah, probably. Which is why some people were hesitant to outright buy the recently released Counter-Strike and stuck to the mod version, at least for a while. As for what was the game of the year 2000, well, Deus Ex is one of the best games ever made. And you can close the video now and pretend I gave it the honor 
of the game of the year 2000. But if you're gonna stick around, it's The Sims. I know that today The Sims is considered a joke, an excuse to sell DLC, but it was, at its time, the best-selling PC game ever made. And it was a very different type of game compared to just about everything else on the market, a notable exception being Seaman for the Sega Dreamcast. The Sims was a life simulator, an approachable one, not a complicated, interface-driven game like Sim Earth or Sim Life. It was a game about managing the day-to-day -day life of a human human being, of a family, building their home, furnishing it, forming relationships with others, and enjoying the sight of their success, living vicariously through them, or most likely giving in to your dark desire as God to this mortal being and bring doom upon it, all to satisfy your twisted, dark needs. And unlike other games that try to do something similar with relationship-based gameplay or some of the more esoteric works by Chris Crawford, this was as mainstream as possible. This was popular and promoted by one of the biggest publishers of the age. This was not an indie game, this was not a fly under the radar cult hit. This was a game about essentially playing with dolls that became the biggest thing on the PC. More than Myst, more than Doom, more than anything before it. Now, the fact that the series devolved into DLC-filled IKEA advertisements shouldn't take away from how big of an impact the game made. At the time, it seemed like it would usher in a new age of video games instead of while well, being the dying breath of the innovation present throughout all of the 90s. That was kind of the theme of the year 2000. This was when we saw the web soar to new records, there being a new million dollar company rising seemingly every week. Everyone wanted a piece of it, throwing money left and right at every site and service with an idea. And then it peaked, and by the end of the year, those sites were going belly up because even though they had raised a lot of money in funding, there was no actual way for them to earn money on their own. They were running out of cash. This spiraled and amplified and what became known as the dot-com bubble burst leading to many people losing a lot of money in a very short time and driving down the acceptance that the internet is serious business, that the web is the future. It is the future, or the present, if you're watching this not after World War III, but after the bubble burst, it didn't seem like it. But at least we got that very same year the first USB flash drive, the first camera phone, the first draft of the human genome, Honda's cute little Asimo robot, walked right into our hearts and well, DeviantArt was launched for better or for worse. And if you think there's something missing, like certain events about stuff blowing up or disasters, let's just say that's on purpose, because next week we're in for a doozy. See you then.